Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Hone and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode, we answer the biggest question of all. Exactly how big did dinosaurs get? Plus comedian Laura Lex on the relationship between birds and dinosaurs. Hello, and I don't know about you, but after lockdown, I'm feeling like I need to lose a bit of weight. I have put, I'm even bigger than I was before. How about you, Dave? Are you big? No comment. (laughs) Are you as big as a dinosaur? I'm as big as a dinosaur that would be the same weight as me. (laughs) Ah, but how big do dinosaurs get? And that is what we are answering, or I'm asking and you are answering, on this week's edition of (laughs) Terrible Lizard. I'm trying to make this... um, more sort of big and deep. yeah i don't know but there's something you know about the scale because this is why dinosaurs are particularly popular is because they're so massive i don't think we've actually talked about this we might have mentioned it but dave i'm going to ask a really in-depth scientific question now okay what is the biggest dinosaur is it indomitus rex <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to edit out the screams at this point where I digitally murder you. Um, no, we've we've danced around this subject a bit at various times, but you, without, without ever really tackling it head on. And it's something that I get asked at almost every single event I ever do and every q and I ever do. Um, and so, we've been, again, in a way, we've done quite well to get to this series without having really dealt with it properly. Um, the short, obvious and inevitable answer is we don't really know. There's a whole bunch of dinosaurs, so all of them sauropods, so let's get that out of the way. Of course, all the sauropods are the very biggest, both in terms of length and in terms of height and in terms of weight, which is the thing we're really interested in. Um, there's four or five fairly credible candidates for being the largest ever. I think the one which gets most of the attention is Argentinosaurus, which has been around for quite a while now. And then in the last couple of years, we've had a thing called Patago Titan from Patagonia. Um, but there's things like inverted commas, what used to be called Seismosaurus and Supersaurus. Supersaurus could jump over buildings, though. In a single bound. I'm not sure how good it would be at stopping bullets. <laughs> um, it was, uh, th- there's a thing from North America called uh, Amphicelius, which got renamed a couple of years ago to something dreadful. And I now can't remember what it's been renamed to, but absolutely everyone knows it as Amphicelius, so I'll stick with that. And there's a thing from India, which is Bathrico something or other. You can tell I didn't double check these names before we tried to do this. Um, but there's these, there's a thing called Dreadnoughtus, which came out only a few years ago from Argentina Um, and when that came out there were several things going it's the biggest dinosaur ever despite obviously being smaller than Argentinosaurus I don't know how that one kind of slipped through Um, but and and there were even a few kind of more common things so like Apatosaurus there's a couple of bits of very very big Apatosaurus skeletons which certainly give lie to the fact that there's probably much bigger ones out there as well well this is the issue isn't it because it's not like you find an entire beautifully laid out sauropod that's massive presumably no um no you you just don't complete sauropods are rare even compared to other complete dinosaurs because yeah they're it's it's simply a sense of scale if you're that big it's surprisingly hard to get it all buried at one point in in one place it has to be really quite an incredible event and the kind of event that would do that is really quite likely to wash some bits away or bash them up because they're sauropods the famous diplodocus carnegii the one which is in 10 15 different museums around the world because of all these copies that are out there is probably the biggest one which is really very complete and in sauropod terms that's positively modest uh, and very much medium sized whereas we're talking about the kind of XXXL um, of sauropod fossils Excellent, so how bigger, how much bigger than Dippy? Because I think a lot of us are familiar with Dippy because we've been to the museums and we've seen Dippy, so how much bigger is Dippy? 
uh, it's Argentinosaurus or whatever it was called. So, so yeah, so uh, Argentinosaurus is the one I'll stick to simply because I know it fairly well, though. Patago Titan has done the rounds recently, and I think that's the one which has been on display in Chicago and New York. So quite a few people have seen a cast of that and a, or a reconstructed version of that. Worth saying up front, sauropods, of course, vary a fair bit, um, particularly in terms of things like the length of the tail, which is kind of important, and Diplodocus, if you remember, is one of your... For jelly Jelly Cordatus, yes. The whip tail. So they have super... So like half the length of Diplodocus is tail. That's probably not true of things like Argentinosaurus. They're going to have a much, much shorter tail. So this is part of the problem of talking about lengths for comparing things. But Diplodocus carnegii, the specimen everyone knows, is something like 20-odd metres long. Um, Very, very big indeed. Argentinosaurus, probably in the realm of 40. Wow, that's big. Trying to find genes. Can you imagine? So, So certainly getting on for double and fundamentally a more massive animal in the sense that it's not just all tail and then of course unbelievably massive because when you have an animal that big it's it's going to be you know massively more kind of bulky and solid yeah because the um, weight you know, goes up exponentially doesn't it yeah but it's the it's the classic threefold thing if something is twice as long it is all if it's a, if it's identically proportioned it is also twice as wide and twice as tall so two times Times two is four, times two is eight, it will be eight times heavier. So that means that, yeah, if you make something twice as long, it's going to be eight times heavier. And therefore, this is part of the problem with this rivalry over exactly who has the heaviest dinosaur, because tiny errors in scaling will make dramatic differences in weight if you only need to get your estimate wrong by three or four percentage points which is extremely easy to do and then of course that scales up massively and suddenly you've added 10 tons to the weight of your animal but how do you do that though because presumably it's not i mean do you have it where it's a part of these animals which get preserved more than other parts so they're easy to reconstruct and complete ones yes and no (laughs) (laughs) is the inevitable answer big robust solid elements that even giant carnivores are probably not going to eat like the femur like the humerus um they're far more likely to survive as in nothing's going to bash them up and therefore if they get buried they're very likely to fossilize and do well whereas remember the vertebrae are fragile and air filled and very prone to distortion and very prone to erosion and, and things like this so yeah for these really big ones we do often have something like a femur or lower limb bone like a tibia or humerus or something thing like that so really big bones and that has kind of two advantages first of all they're relatively easy to compare to each other because those elements at least we tend to find multiple times and also the femur in particular both its length and width but best of all its circumference around the middle even though that's often a kind of really weird flat oval in sauropods is a pretty good indicator of how heavy an animal is bones have to take the weight of the animal that they're supporting uh, and of course when you're walking i mean when you when you're running it gets even harder but these animals are never getting above a walk but of course they don't just stand statically with all four limbs on the t- on the ground they're going to walk which means at times at least one and at certainly occasionally probably two legs are off the ground so that means the weight is now going through two legs not four and then of course you know the mere momentum of moving means there's going to be more uh, you know force going through that limb and on top of that animals have or all things basically have what's called a safety factor for stuff like this in other words how much abnormal force is required to break it and i can't remember what the value is but for animals there's, there's a there's a fairly constant number that natural selection seems to have settled upon because obviously you could make your bones super 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 strong and unbreakable but then they're really heavy and you've got to lug them round all the time and you could make them really really light and make yourself light and agile and that saves you lots of energy because you don't have to lug all this extra weight around but you risk breaking them um and there's a fairly standard sweet spot which clearly is the difference between not breaking them all the time and not having to lug around the extra weight and and so that 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 kind of upscaling is fairly uniform and therefore as a result simply measuring a few simple metrics of a femur gives you a decent but not fantastic estimate of how heavy something is so did they do this with other animals how did they how do you know how they arrived at this conclusion yeah so i mean that's how this kind of thing started that there's this 
I think we've talked about this before, but there's this kind of almost tautology in paleontology. Now, the tautology is the wrong word. There's this there's this thing which often happens in paleontology, which is we end up doing stuff that normal biologists don't bother to do because we want to learn something about fossil animals. So, you know, if a biologist wants to know how heavy an elephant is, they just go and weigh an elephant. It's it's not actually that difficult. Whereas you lop the leg off the elephant, get all the meat off, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but if but you know but if the, if you want to know the you know short of whales, if you want to know the weight of an animal, it's not too hard to find one and weigh it. Um, and lots of people have done that in the past. You're not necessarily very interested in working out well exactly how would you be able to estimate that from its skeleton or from its muscles or for or this that the other because you know the answer. And so it's people like paleontologists who are very interested in this, and not just dinosaurs, of course, if you're looking at various fossil animals, you're doing exactly the same thing. And yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it was, um, it may well have been a guy called uh, McNeil Alexander who first really looked at this. He was a paleontologist and biomechanicist who died, oh, I'm going to say 10, 15 years ago now, but absolutely brilliant and did a whole bunch of stuff. But yeah, just go measure a whole bunch of things. Right, we know they all weigh this much and we know that this bone's this long and this wide. Oh, actually, there's a fair fairly good correlation here we can probably extend that and stick other you know dots on the graph and and read off an, an estimated weight as usual there's a couple of caveats to that first of all the obvious one is that you know things vary quite heavily even within species and so it's not that you've got to take this with a kind of grain of salt but particularly when you're talking about things like well exactly which one's biggest well, when you've got a 20% plus error margin and they're a fraction different from each other. The variation of just my mates, you know, I've got people who come up to my navel. I mean, it's ridiculous. But but that that's kind of, those are different sized individuals. What I mean is you could find two skeletons with identical measurements and yet the animals would have weighed quite different amounts. That's like me before and after lockdown. Well, right. And so that's, you know, individuals vary quite a lot. The one I the one I found uh, a while back was looking into a, a related part of this is I think for things like grizzly bears. Yeah, they get really fat and really thin. Well, their peak weight at the start of hibernation versus their lowest weight at the end of hibernation, which admittedly is really odd because bears are kind of weird and, you know, most animals don't do this, but it's basically double. They will double their weight or then halve it at the end between an annual cycle and so you could look at a, you know this estimate of a bear and go oh this bear is 600 kilograms and the tr- you know that's about right but at the end of hibernation he was 400 kilograms and when he next goes into hibernation he'd be 800 kilograms so both 400 and 800 are right for the same individual within six months <laughs> and therefore again <laughs> Again, quite jealous of that. Yeah. Quite jealous. It would be a good life. Yeah, sleep sleep for six months and lose a ton of fat. It's brilliant. 200 kilos is a big guy. You know, that is a big man. Yeah, we're talking about double that. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, going from four to eight. That Those are the kind like of numbers that they're pulling. Two chunky guys. That's cool. Yeah, it's it's really quite incredible. Did he have to eat two men? To, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, in terms of our estimating how big are the big, so that's our first big caveat with doing things like measuring limbs and scaling them is there's variation. Um, the second one, of course, is we don't really know what's happening at that kind of upper end. The graph looks pretty good. And as I say, you, you know, you can put tiny things like shrews and bats on there and frogs and all the way up to elephants and draw lines. Right now. Yeah, this is really quite a good correlation. Yeah, there's some scatter, but it, it's really quite good. Um, and, and you're covering a huge range of sizes. So animals, you know, 10 grams up to seven, eight tons. But the kind of dinosaurs we're talking about, some of the estimates are in the ballpark of like 70 to 80 tons. And it's like, we don't know if that nice straight line, once you get above, say, 10 tons, goes up or goes down <laughs> or carries on exactly as it was before. Can I ask a really nerdy question? Do you know how mm. heteroscedastic it is around the mean? So is there a lot of animals at one end? So the lighter animals, is there more variation? and their bigger animals as the more variation. I don't no. know. Because it'd be interesting that, because then you could work out if you're really wrong or probably slightly less wrong. 
There might well be, but then you've got far more smaller animals. Yeah. So you're almost inevitably going to get more. You know, how many fully terrestrial animals, I'm not including things like seals, are over one ton at adult? 20 species or so? There's few antelope and big cows and, and bison and things like this. Rhino, elephant, hippo, giraffe, and... Then Occasional kind documentaries of about people um, with diseases. <laughs> they, they are the, that big. That is that. The, thousand pounds maybe but not a thousand kilos yeah that's true we're still talking about more than double that once once you get above even a hundred kilos you're down to about a couple of percentage points of vertebrates left and when you're down to the you know over a ton it's very very few so yeah we don't know quite what might be happening further out when you do these kinds of factors you find that yeah you you can you can tweak your numbers and your exact measurements to make patago titan bigger or argentinosaurus bigger or um seismosaurus bigger or uh, even dreadnoughtus and at this point almost who cares because we we really don't know is there a way just before we go on to talking about like which bits of them you find because i remember us talking about um trace fossils like their footprints because i know that you were yeah. talking about the fact that the footprints make them seem bigger but is there still a way that you can work out how big they were just by their footprints at all no, not really, um, you need because to know the it's conditions, that's don't you? yeah, because because that that's the exact thing, you know, exactly how dry was the sand or or mud, exactly how you know what was the drying conditions like, this that and the other. Um, there's definitely been a couple of papers looking at this, um, but again, you're off the charts with the scales, and you know, really subtle things like exactly what they're step pattern was could shift weight subtly differently and therefore make a print slightly wider or deeper and therefore change how you'd estimate the mass so bleh. messy it's too messy well yeah and and there's not many tracks of really really big sauropods and the, the few that i have seen are the ones which are this this underprinting effect where the footprint's obviously far bigger than it should be okay so what bits of sauropods are most common that we find? I mean, I mean, we've talked about how the event would have to be really rare to get a whole one. Yeah, I remember you saying once that their skulls are very hard to find. Yeah, so so sauropod skulls basically don't exist. There's almost a kind of like little meme joke about that in among are we sure they dinosaur have researchers. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yes, um, but it's, you know, they're, they're vanishingly rare. I mean, I want to say something like a couple of dozen total, which for a couple of hundred species, some of which are known from a lot of individuals, is really quite pathetic. Ethic. There's there's very very few certainly you know good complete ones. Whereas you look at something like let's say T Rex for example, that is a big skull of a carnivore, which are rare animals. We got ten probably good skulls of that. That's just one species. <laughs> That's one species with an even bigger head, um, which would be again harder to bury, etc. Is that because their heads were so light because they're at the end of a really long neck? Yeah, I, th I think that's a really big part of it. They're very, very fragile constructions and quite possibly... I've, I've always wondered about this and it may sound ridiculous, but quite possibly these animals probably don't exactly lie down just before they die. They're probably still... F I, I suspect the really big one didn't lie down at all. You know, they, they probably sleep standing up. In which case, when it actually dies, it's going to drop and hit the ground. And if you've got a head that unbelievably fragile and fine, and it hits anything on the way down... It'll smush its own head. It's probably not going to do it many favours. I really don't think that dying sauropods just shatter all their skulls, but I bet it doesn't help. And I bet a few of them are broken because of that, in a way that they're probably not for other things. I do have the wonderful image now of sleeping sauropods sleeping like um, flamingos do. Oh, so one leg with the others tucked up. Yes. There's a there's a there's a Gary Larson of that with a rhino. Oh, lovely! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think. But, but going back to like the, the bits that we find, so that's where Dreadnoughtus is really quite interesting because although it's really not the biggest, there's an awful lot of it. You've got most of the body, dorsal vertebrae in the back, the ribs, both legs, and a chunk of tail. Uh, that's a hell of a lot of one, and some some bits of neck and, and other bits and bobs. Yeah, you get lots of vertebrae, very few heads. Um, the vertebrae you tend to 
get are isolated or, or there's only bits of them and you get yeah lots of big leg bones because they are these giant fat things and even things like big tyrannosaurs or uh, giganotosaurus and stuff like this is not going to be chomping through them so they're very likely to survive you know if they got washed into a river they're not going to erode even if they bang against a few rocks so yeah we get quite a lot of legs the thing is their legs aren't very exciting at all there's really not a lot of information to get from them you, you know almost all of it is in the architecture of the complexities of the of these pneumatic vertebrae yeah because the legs aren't pneumatic simply because they're holding the weight yeah i mean th- they could potentially be but i don't know of any that are as in pneumatic verte- pneumatic extensions can invade things like limbs um because they do in the pterosaurs for example but yeah i suspect the reason they're not doing it in sauropods is because they're really big and heavy and so they don't do it so yeah they're just very big solid blocks of bone basically but they're also kind of amorphous they they've lost a lot of the subtlety of little ridges and expansions and in here and there and they had giant cartilage caps on the end again to kind of give you a bit of springiness and give you a bit of cushioning in the joints and the grinding you can imagine bones do in an animal that big when it's walking um so one thing you often see with the really big ones is the hole in the pelvis that the head of the femur sits in is like twice the size of the femur and it looks like it's going to be rattling around in this giant hole but that would all have been filled with cartilage because again you've got this 50 plus ton body sitting on the legs and they've got to be able to take it you want some cushioning in there so that you're not grinding your bone on bone every time you take a step or you're not going to last very long or they were actually skipping all the time and you needed the shock absorber for that reason they were they were bouncing like kangaroos for, well but they'd, they'd be pronking at that point they would be pronking pronking is an actual thing yes also known as stotting um and for anyone who's 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 lost pronking or stotting is what various antelope do so pronghorn do this i think um but most famously springbok uh, and a few things in um sub-saharan africa where the the animals jump with all four legs simultaneously so they do these huge leaps into the air often with the head down tail up and and all the kind of legs hanging underneath them and this is supposed to be a um like an anti-predator signal uh, of basically look how high i can jump look how you know effortless i'm moving you don't want to eat me you want to eat gary over there who you notice can't jump anything like as high as i am limpy gary yeah yeah but also they can use it quite well to change direction. I mean, they're quite agile. You know, it does prove their agility. Oh, yeah, it, it does. I mean, there's other things like this, like nightingales are supposed to sing when they're being chased by birds of prey. And it's supposed to be the same thing. Mm. Is look at me. I'm, you know, I'm just expending energy freely, you know, massively reducing my oxygen intake by bothering to sing while you're trying to catch me. So, yeah, leave it alone. Anyway, we've got a topic. <laughs> that's, that's still on topic because I'm imagining now <laughs> Tannosaurus whistling as it jumps about a bit because, to be fair, I don't think anything was actually attacking sauropods were they well the, the big the big ones probably not um that you know in general big theropods are mostly targeting the juveniles of big dinosaurs it's not that this never happened but it's it's similar to modern sub-saharan africa you know there are some lion groups which will tackle elephants um in particular though they tend to tackle young ones and there are still very few you know um, and unpopular ones that, that go for the young unpopular do. ones that aren't going to be defended. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, that the adults don't like very much. Um, but it, but it's a similar kind of thing, you know. St- so stuff like Argentinosaurus is around with predators like Giganotosaurus. They, I think those two specifically overlap. Giganotosaurus is T-Rex size, not as heavy, but 10, 12 meters plus long, probably five plus tons. That is a huge and dangerous carnivore. But against an adult Argentinosaurus, which is, I think, probably the minimum good estimates these days are 50 tons. And the kind of maximum but reasonable and fairly solid estimates are 80 plus tons. So we're looking at a fox going after an elephant. Not quite. Well, more or less, actually, a lion going after an elephant, uh, you know, 10 to 20 times heavier. Why would you do that? (laughs) Particularly when they have lots and lots of millions and squillions of babies but they don't well, that's, that's the thing. You know, the, these big, you know, these big adults, they're going to be slow. They're, you know, if they're not going to be very good at kicking you or hitting you with their tail or hitting you with their neck. 
But if they do connect, it's gonna hurt. It's quite probably gonna break something. And there's way easier stuff out there. So, yeah, they're, they're probably more or less immune. I mean, again, you know, they're not completely immune to predators, but adult rhino, adult hippo, these are not things that even groups of lions usually go after. <laughs> yeah, these really big sauropods are probably virtually immune to predators. The babies are being eaten like popcorn. Um... <laughs> And again, remember, you know, a big baby might be three tons. You know, I think every time I say baby, people assume it's like, oh, it's just come out the egg and it's tiny. And it's like, well, yeah, those two, you know, a 10-year-old Argentinosaurus is probably three, four tons. That's still quite smaller than an adult Giganotosaurus. It's probably well within its food range. How long does it take to get big then, do you reckon? Well, they, I mean, they grow like mad, so 20 years or so. Okay, it's still so a long time, though. To 20 to 30. To... Right, but... But when you consider that it takes an elephant that long to get to full size and an elephant is born big and has only got to get to, you know, an, ele- an, you know, an elephant at birth is what, four or five hundred kilos? Oh, that might be a bit much. Let's call it 250. So to get to five tons, it's got to get 20 times heavier. Um, but a hatchling Argentinosaurus, we've got the same egg problem that we've talked about before. A hatchling Argentinosaurus is going to be five kilos, 10 at an absolute push, and it's got to get to 80 tons. Can we get one for the house can we get a baby yeah. one it'll be so cool yeah you'll struggle to flush it down the toilet after six months exactly and you get bored it'd with be it. like terrapins but worse but, you know, so they're growing, you know, 200 times bigger in the same time that an elephant is growing 20 times bigger. It's really quite impressive, or even 2,000 times bigger. So, yeah, much, much faster growth rate than that. The thing is, if we've got so many rare fossils and only bits of them are being fossilised, I mean, could there be, have we actually sort of looked in all the areas that we find them? Is like, there's definitely nothing more in South America, but is there somebody else, somewhere else stuff, or is there loads to be discovered? Well, the, the, fact, the fact that Dreadnought Nautus and Patago Titan have come out of South America after Argentinosaurus. Um, oh, and I think there's Antarctosaurus, which despite its name is from the kind of North Pole. tip of it's Argentina per- <laughs> and Chile. It's Antarct in the, in the sense of very southern, but if I remember correctly, it's actually from continental South America. Part of the reason these are coming out is most of these things that we've been talking about are titanosaurs. The titanosaurs as a group were mostly around in the late Cretaceous and particularly common in South America. And we've got lots of lots of good fossil beds in South America. That's at least part of that conjunction. But yeah, we've already got three or four of these, as I say, eight, six, seven, eight credible candidates. Half of them at least are from Argentina and that region. And a couple of them have turned up in the last five years, certainly in the last 10. So it's pretty reasonable that there could well be more out there. And you've you've got this kind of double prong effect of, of that, if you like. First of all, we probably haven't found the biggest species because, yeah, big things are rarer. They're harder to find. We're still turning them up. Um, you know, there's still large places we haven't explored very much. There's a lot of stuff going on in Argentina. You know, dinosaurs in Australia are only really getting going now. Done very little digging in Antarctica so far. Uh, you know, those are all areas which are likely to be very productive in the coming years. There's some really big stuff come out of India. India and India still, I think, is really kind of under explored well, for dinosaurs. The egg beds were, weren't they, in India? And that's where Titanosaurus, the original Titanosaur, is from. So yeah, they're around. Because remember, India used to be one of those southern continents. Um, so yeah, that's another good place to probably find really big stuff. So first of all, have we found the biggest species? Probably not. Even if we have, even if it turns out long run that actually, when we do some rescaling and some remeasuring, Argentinosaurus, for argument's sake, is the one. We've got four skeletons of it, I think. Certainly not much more than that. I I don't know the exact number. Not very much at all. So let's do a survey um, and pick four random human adults. You'd probably be surprised if any one of them was over about six foot four. (laughs) Yeah. We get bigger than that. (laughs) <laughs> right. So so the, the so the one I like throwing out is because I looked at this with Jordan Mallon. I've done some stuff with him on sexual dimorphism, but it's linked into this issue of size and distributions of populations. Um so we dug up this nice study that was done in America. Well not even a study, it was kind of an, an aside from their point of view. They've been surveying alligators out in Florida. 
And so they, they go out and, and count these every year and they count a couple of thousand um, every and every year they find something like three or four on average that are over four meters long. Whoa. So these are animals that are about a one in 500. And OK, that's including adults and juveniles, but still a one in 500 individual is four meters long. The record alligator that's been verified is something like 4.6 or 4.7 meters. So about another 20 percent bigger than that and remember we've only actually got good verified measurements of alligators for about a hundred years as a species they've probably been around for a few million years and at the moment we've massively reduced their population in the last few centuries destroying their habitats right so <laughs> how big would the the absolute single individual biggest adult alligator mississippiensis ever have been I'd be gobsmacked if it was under five metres, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if it was well over that. Seven metres. And remember, four metres is already a one in a thousand animal. Yeah. <laughs> and we're talking about 25, 30% bigger than that. And what's, and what's our Argentina saw a sample? Four. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we haven't found the biggest one. <laughs> well, that was quite recently, in the last five years or so, they discovered a great white shark, which was huge. Huge, much larger than they thought, you know, the largest one ever was. And it got a lot of press attention, particularly in Australia, where they like them. Yeah. Because that's also the other thing. I mean, there are diseases like gigant giganticism. Yes, there's gigantism. Yes. So people have asked about this before. So Robert Wadlow is famously the, like the tallest man ever. And something, you know, like three, three and a half metres is, you know, absolutely incredible height. And he suffered from a, I think he had agro, I can't remember if he's an agromegaly or gigantism. But there's similar things with a basic maturity gland problem, the overproduced growth hormone. And obviously he's enormous, but he had characteristic problems like a really big jaw, really big hands, disproportionately big. Um, and these things commonly turn up. There's that famous, I think, world living tallest man. Last I checked was a, a Mongolian guy. And he's been in the news a couple of times because they, they used him to rescue a dolphin. <laughs> there was a dolphin with something stuck in its throat. Oh, right. And he basically could reach in and get it because his arms were so long. Um, yeah, I know. Bizarre, but I've, I've definitely seen that. Um, but yeah, he has the same thing. You can see the structure of his face. And yeah, in theory, that could happen in dinosaurs. But I think you'd probably aid these things. Of course, anything suffering from that in the wild is very unlikely to survive to adult, you know, Just the stress robert and the wadley heart and, died yeah. well robert wadley died young i mean it was you know there's all kinds of problems with these kinds of um uh, you know conditions um so it's very unlikely that they'd survive in the real world but even if they did you'd probably spot it because they you know the, you'd have these repeated patterns that would show up even in the fossil record um while we're on the subject so here's a tiny and awkward error which is something even i perpetuated in my very first paper and possibly a couple of times since and I've been desperate to correct since it was corrected to me. Hang on, hang on. I'll the do difference the jingle. Between... I'll do the jingle. Du, 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 Dave's wrong. Yay. Du, 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 Dave's wrong again. Du, 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 Dave's wrong. Yay. Here he is correcting himself. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and right now. So the difference between gigantism and giantism. Ooh. Yes. Spelling. So what... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically the extra G. So what we've been just been talking about is gigantism, uh, and what uh, which is which is an individual who is gigantic, not necessarily associated with the medical condition gigantism. So just to be sl even more slightly awkward, but just if you say Jumbo the elephant, so that's where people don't know that the idea that Jumbo means big comes from a famous elephant at London Zoo who was later sold to P. T. Barnum, who was called Jumbo and at the time was the biggest ever elephant on record did that was that the one that was ended up hanged that was a different no one. jumbo was hit by a train oh, okay um was part of the pt barnum circus i think there was a breakdown he got out and then hit by a train on the tracks coming the other way so jumbo was a gigantic individual but there's no evidence that he was suffering from anything like gigantism um whereas giantism which is often what we're talking about with dinosaurs is a lineage in general or a species as a whole being enormous like the dutch <laughs> right so yeah so but yeah dutch are very tall sauropods as a whole are showing you know giantism they are huge 
Um, if you looked at something like Apatosaurus, as I mentioned, there is a gigantic individual which you could say is undergoing gigantism. Um, and it's a subtlety, but it's often completely misused in the literature. And as I said, I, I've been guilty of that a while ago. Uh, the way I always remember it, because obviously it's the best, the, the simplest thing is to refer to pop culture of anyone who's seen enough of The Simpsons, the famous softball episode, and I believe it's Ken Griffey Jr. who's drinking the brain and nerve tonic. And Dr. Hibbert goes, my God, gigantism. And he's got the giant head and really big hands sat in the wheelchair. Gigantism. There you go. So if you've watched that episode of The Simpsons from like 1991. Uh... <laughs> it, it was, it, I believe it was season three. It's probably my single favourite episode ever. <laughs> well done. Uh, not that... <laughs> Which helps me remember. Yeah, also, also, also remember that some of our listeners are seven. So... <laughs> <laughs> they shouldn't be with some of the words we use. <laughs> no, I, I edit those out. I'm very good. I'm very good. So if you had to guess about the biggest dinosaur out there. Do you think there is a way that we could actually work out? Because there's a limit of things like arachnids simply because of lung, uh, their capacity of oxygen and that sort of thing. So people did some estimates on that back in like the 1980s, I think. And the number that they came to was already a very vast figure. And it was between 100 and 150 tonnes was the biological limit. At which point, basically, your bones get so big and the muscles attached to those bones get so so big that basically your front and back legs meet and at that point you can't physically move because there's nowhere for your legs to go um how unless accurate you that... spring boxed it around you spring yes it. Uh, <laughs> but they're probably not jumping very high at 100 tons uh how accurate that is and it's already got a 50 percent error in its spread very hard to say um but as i say there are multiple credible estimates which could still be quite wrong but in the realm of 80 tons and I don't think anyone has a huge problem with them. I think, as I say, the kind of minimum credible estimates are about 50 tonnes for these biggest ones. Um, I, I think it's very unlikely that the really big Argentinosaurus, ones that we know of, not even these putative individuals that we haven't yet found or other species, are 50 tonnes plus. And to put that in perspective, because people are more familiar with the T-Rex, how much does a T-Rex weigh, roughly? Seven, nine are absolute upper estimate. So nine tonnes versus 50 tonnes. Mm. Yeah, mm. right, and almost and almost certainly lower on the T Rex and higher on the sauropod. You know, a, a big a big African bull elephant is seven eight tons. So you're talking about eight of them together. That's a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And also, I'm, I'm afraid all I will remember from this episode is uh, just uh, sauropods flopping down like my cat and accidentally braining themselves. That is <laughs> my, my residing image. Still, somebody who is much smaller than even an African elephant <laughs> is now uh, coming on the podcast. Uh, she is a comedian. She is absolutely amazing. Her name is Laura Lex, and here she is to ask Dave her dinosaur question. Hello, Laura. Thank you so much for coming on Terrible Lizards podcast. Tell me, do you do you like dinosaurs? Is this something you're that you've ever been interested in? Not especially, but I right, have a younger. Bro- <laughs> 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 I have a younger brother who's ten years younger than me, wow. and he was obsessed with them as a kid. So I kind of like absorbed quite a lot of that and had to read to him about them. And then in my life now, I like to knit dinosaurs. <gasps> We're being shown a pterosaur. So if you need a mascot for the podcast and you want me to knit you a dinosaur... It's not a dinosaur. Is it not? Why? No. no. It's a pterosaur. Those are the fly ones. They're different. Ooh. So terra means flying, doesn't it? Like... A uh, wing. T- t- wing. P-T-E-R what does dino P-T-E-R. mean then? Terrible. Well, yeah, generally mistranslated as, as terrible, as in terrible lizard. But the original intention was closer to something like terrible as in begetting terrible terror and being gotcha. fearful and fear uh, awesome so awesome would probably be a better one word description yeah dinosaurs are awesome reptiles not terrible lizards but obviously that's what everyone knows which is why we used it for the name <laughs> so pterosaur literally <laughs> means wing reptile oh, right. and that's not but they're not dinosaurs because dinosaurs are measured this is what i've learned from the podcast see dinosaurs are not measured by you know stuff that was alive then they're measured by specific bones and things that they all have in common and they 
come from the same sort of like bit. Well, it, I mean, it's a bit like saying cats aren't dogs. I mean, that sounds tautologous to us because we're so familiar with both groups and we know that they're fundamentally different. But it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, ultimately, pterosaurs are fairly closely related to dinosaurs. They have a lot of things in common, but they're not the same thing. And gotcha. get this though, Laura, right? Even though pterosaurs are not dinosaurs, robins and owls and eagles are dinosaurs. What? What? Yes. I know! What? <laughs> So if I'd knitted a robin, that's I'd have a knitted a dinosaur, but yes. I've knitted this pterosaur and that's not and a dinosaur. That's not. <laughs> that's fun. This is why everyone loves this is why everyone loves scientists, because of the pedantry <laughs> and the constantly correcting of everything. <laughs> So already we have educated you beyond your wildest dreams, <laughs> but uh, is there anything specific that you would like to ask? Yeah, we, got... we haven't got to the question yet. No, exactly, <laughs> I know. So what, what is your question? What would you like to ask real-life paleontologist Dr Dave Hone? So as a person who only really reads headlines about new things about dinosaurs and then does none of the extra research required to understand those headlines... I hear a lot like, dinosaurs had feathers, more like birds than lizards. Interesting. Okay. Does that mean they shared any behavioural things with birds as we know them? And specifically, I want to know about, like, the family setup of dinosaurs. Like, was the mum sticking around? Was the dad sticking around? Was it like, lay some eggs and bog off on your own? How did that kind of set itself up? Birds are literally dinosaurs, so that is one of the things, now that we know this, that we can use our information and understanding about birds to try and interpret dinosaurs. And yet one of the things that does link them together is the fact that feathers are really common in dinosaurs, they're present in loads of different groups, possibly quite a few more, but that's a more complicated story for another time. Um, and various birdy type behaviours are definitely present. Um, so we have parents sitting on nests of eggs, which is pretty cool and pretty good indicator of what they're doing. Um, one thing, particularly with stuff like that and parental care, yes. When you say we have that, so like, like there's like a fossilised, like Pompeii, they just got, they, they died there on the thing well so so the, the the ones that we usually refer to are actually sand um but you can imagine a big sandstorm in a desert just dumps an absolute ton on everything and if you're yeah. not a big enough animal not to get buried or if you're sitting on your eggs and you think you'll survive it you're probably not going anywhere and it turns out you you got it wrong uh, <laughs> <laughs> um so so yeah we we literally have whole skeletons of animals sat on bunches of eggs the eggs of which contain embryos of animals that look very similar to the animal sat on the nest and therefore is almost certainly the same species so it's not a chance association of something on the wrong nest or a cuckoo like effect or anything like that yeah that, that you know that's really quite convincing uh, in yeah. one in one case one that actually came out fairly recently those embryos are relatively late stage which is implying that these animals are doing still doing this brooding relatively close to hand Catching, um, which of course is quite nice to know. Uh, this is actually one of those things where we're already really quite confident that they're doing this because basically birds, with a couple of very notable exceptions, but almost universally, birds provide both pre and post hatching parental care. In other words, they look after the eggs and they look after the babies. Loads of reptiles, uh, so all kinds of snakes and lizards, for example, look after the eggs, but once they've hatched, they pretty much ignore them. So that's pre hatching, but not post hatching. Um, but the other other group of reptiles that are still alive today that are the closest to the dinosaurs is the crocodilians mm. and they also all do pre and post hatching parental do they care. carry their babies in their mouths yeah so so typically mum will pick them up and take them to the river and she will also look after them and protect them and respond if they call as alarm calls or i wouldn't let my mum do that I'm not going she'd no. snap me she'd eat me yeah not a good idea um <laughs> But but it means that we have this thing we call bracketing. So if you basically have not the crocodilians are the ancestors, but they're the nearest thing to crocodile ancestors. So if all of them are doing post hatching parental care and all of the birds are doing post hatching parental care, it's a reasonable first assumption that dinosaurs are. Yeah. And then of course on top of that, we then have the fossils preserving things like big adults with very young juveniles or an adult sitting on a nest of eggs. And so it's pretty convincing, obviously. I'm sure there were tons of species that didn't do that, that evolved different weird mechanisms and were doing other things. But as a generality, the vast majority of dinosaurs were probably doing this. There are dinosaurs which definitely, well, we think didn't do the whole sort of like family brooding thing. And that's the sauropods. 
Yeah. What, the... What's a sauropod? So saur is lizard, is it? Reptile. So, so lizard feet. Is... Okay. Anything with a big long neck. So Diplodocus, Brachiosaurus, Brontosaurus, Apatosaurus, and all of that. The really big ones are the sauropods. The ones that start really small, get really fat and go really small again. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I yeah. can picture that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We've got nests of theirs, or at least some where they're laying eggs in volcanic ash and using that as basically their incubator. Um, Smart. So, like a natural au pair. There's some living birds that do that as well. They, they trek over to the slopes of the volcano and bury their eggs there. Huh. But we're talking um, like thousands of them or hundreds. Of yeah, them. there's the there's the beds in. I want to say it's India. Where, I mean, I haven't been there, and I've never even seen photos. But supposedly there are places where you can just walk across broken eggshell. It's just just a field of it. But they're more like that's yeah, they're more like turtles, and they'd be like modern birds in that sense. Yeah, so that, them, I mean yeah. that. Yeah, that's the potential. I mean, th- this is this is this always starting to get more confusing than it used to. I, th- I think a few years ago, people would have said, based on the bracketing and what we see from various examples, and go, well, you know, this is probably what dinosaurs are doing. Yes, certainly some of the bigger sauropods, maybe most sauropods, are doing something else. But your average dinosaur is laying eggs in some kind of nest, looking after that nest, and when the babies are hatching, looking after them for a bit, possibly for a very long time, but certainly like crocodiles at least for a few weeks or months maybe a year or two um and then 18 months ago two years ago now there was a paper came out of uh the american museum of natural history in new york uh where they looked at some late stage embryos now embryos uh of reptiles at least when they grow their teeth they have this weird property of they grow their the outside of their teeth in basically little layers and they grow a layer a day. And this appears to be pretty universal. And in theory, therefore, you can cut through that tiny, 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 tiny tooth and count the layers and know how old it is. Or at least know how long it's had teeth, because, of course, they won't have teeth for a while, at least. Um, And the numbers they were getting were staggering, like 200 days. And you're like, okay, that's like seven months. And then there was the time before that where it didn't even have its teeth. What? Animals, you know, no reptile and no bird has an egg which stays underground for you know six seven eight months you just don't you know even ostriches and elephant birds and things with enormous eggs it's a couple of months maybe three or four and we're talking about relatively sm- like apple sized eggs these are not particular or a bit bigger than that but like not giant eggs of the biggest dinosaurs now okay it's basically a couple of data points they only looked at a couple of different species uh, one of which at least lived in the desert maybe the desert's a bit weird because of seasonality but still, that's an incredibly... Well, I can't imagine the adults are sitting next to the egg, for, to the nest for eight or nine months. But it's also hard to imagine that they'd completely abandon it and then come back later. So what are they doing? Just abandoning them? Well, that's weird because we know they don't usually do that. Mm. So what's going on? <laughs> And I don't think anyone really knows. That's so fascinating. So what kind of... So you've got an egg that's sitting on the ground. What kind of... So some di- other dinosaurs and stuff would have preyed on their eggs and sort of eaten them. There are mammals around at this point? There, there are. So one of the classic Victorian why did the dinosaurs die out things was the mammals ate their eggs. And it's like, yes, and the mammals had lived alongside them for 150 million years at this point. But that day, all the mammals ever... You know, it's just like, it's, it's not really a great explanation. Yeah, I mean, most things, to be honest, will eat eggs. They're absolutely packed with protein and moisture. And provided mum or dad isn't around, they're basically defenseless so you know even herbivores you know things like deer if they come across a nest of bird's eggs they'll quite happily chomp down on because it's just free high value food um so absolutely anything will eat them the actual evidence for things eating dinosaur eggs is basically non-existent because eggshells are really fragile and don't usually preserve so the idea that you then find evidence of an animal because it's got to either like die in the act or somehow you know leave something behind choke on it could choke on it could transform it whole potentially (laughs) but the one we do have is uh i want to say it's pronounced sajana i know i've probably horribly mangled that we should probably look it up but that's a snake in india found among embryos of sauropods 
so oh. and and it's a pretty big snake as well i mean like modern big python size um and the interpretation is it's probably hoovering up eggs and or baby dinosaurs because this is yeah a field of, of a, a field of nests and eggs with probably the adults are not hanging around and lots of bites on his babies and the snake was probably making merry oh poor babies mm. yeah but happy snake but happy snake yeah, yes that's exactly true. what i was going to say Swings and roundabouts. Somebody should write a song about, like, the the oval of life or something in the way... (laughs) The oval of life. (laughs) I I think you might get done for copyright by the estate of Brent White (laughs) and associates. The pill-shaped form of life. Because they're pills, aren't they? Dinosaur eggs. They're not... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. the oval. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Oval. Um, what am I thinking of? Uh, melons, when you get a rather flat melon and it's kind of like compressed rugby ball shape. Hmm. Yeah. They're not They're not, They're not. not egg-shaped, which is... A- actually. Oh, for a oh, look. There you go. There's one. That's a kiwi. Kiwi fruit fruit. Yeah. I thought that was actually a dinosaur. Occasionally he'll bring up a fossil and just show I've people. Got a, I've got a dinosaur egg in the box, I think. Go get your dinosaur egg. I never used to understand eggs as a kid. I thought that, like fertilizing eggs i thought the girl bird laid the eggs and then like the boy bird peed on the eggs to fertilize them i didn't understand frogs doesn't it so does it is that how it works the frogs frogs, they literally did an experiment back in the day stuff oh i was gonna uh palazzini whatever his name is put trousers on frogs to see if the frogs still fertilized the eggs and so by putting trousers on (laughs) so that's how he proved that sperm met the eggs in the water rather than in the frog wow but but that all happens inside the body of a bird. Oh, look at that! Mm. There's a dinosaur egg. Yeah, so that, that's a, that's one of the overaptorosaurs. So this is the these oh, are the wow. kind that we're finding. The parents sat on the egg. And you can see, obviously, the... the camera doesn't like it, but you can see the texture of the kind of graininess. Yeah, and how big the di- so well, you're showing me that that's sort of under thirty centimeters long, isn't it? How big does the adult dinosaur that comes out of that get to be? This is going to be an animal that's kind of cassowary size and shape. Yeah. Because she knows what a cassowary is, Dave. Emu. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, but cassowary okay. is, is a bit bigger than emu. It's just why I picked cassowary. I know they're a bit bigger, but... <laughs> <laughs> Izzy just saw the look on my face there. I was just like, shall I just nod and pretend I'm intelligent? Like, mm, the cassowary, which is famously as big as a cassowary, <laughs> as I understand it. It is for me. It's exactly how big it is. It's an mm-hmm. excellent analogy for an animal of that size. <laughs> this, this is the thing, because Dave is like zoology background. He knows all of the animals and exactly their entire lives. And therefore... I what cassowaries are. I mean, I, you know, I didn't pick an onocophoran or a tinamol. An emu <laughs> and an ostrich is more familiar. Yeah, I immediately started picturing a kiwi, if I'm totally honest. Yeah, they're a bit smaller. Yeah. Right, yeah. But, but why? Because that's a kiwi. And you know what a kiwi is because it's a kiwi. You should have been picturing You probably a just showed me a kiwi fruit and now I'm thinking about kiwis. And then you said cassowary and I went, I think that's a bird. <laughs> so imagine an ostrich shaped animal. So relatively long legs, relatively long neck with a little head and quite a big body. Make the neck and head rather fatter and bigger and give it a bit of a tail, but make it about a metre and a half or so tall. Okay. All right. And that's coming out that weenie egg. Hmm. Well, not a whole one no no fair just constantine it out like <laughs> yes you got a really good air, high pressure air pump <laughs> up to your, to your car's um cigarette lighter <laughs> <laughs> but their eggs even the big ones don't lay massive eggs they're, they're like the biggest eggs aren't that big the, the biggest eggs are 30 odd centimeters long quite wide and so they're rather flatter because they they need some surface area but yeah you you basically can't build eggs bigger than that the, 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 so the pterosaur is different to the dinosaurs the things that we know of as sea dinosaurs are they the same are they laying eggs in shells or are they laying more like spawn or are they coming out of the water to breed what are they doing so those are also not dinosaurs dinosaurs right. uh, and, it, and in fact are a massive assemblage of all kinds of different lineages that went back to the sea and conveniently we have our bonus podcast which will come after this one is on that very subject so yeah marine Hooray. marine reptiles this marine is reptiles. how frustrating that recording was we we're speaking to yeah. a, a, an expert <laughs> on it and she said she sort of said yeah because you know like an example of a marine reptile right now would be a penguin 
<laughs> because they are birds, they are dinosaurs, they are from the reptiles. Birds yeah, are okay. dinosaurs, dinosaurs are reptiles, and it, penguins fundamentally live in and are adapted to live in the sea. Ergo, marine reptile. So, a, but, but a bird isn't a reptile. Birds it are is, reptiles. technically, yeah. Birds are reptiles. I know, it's upsetting, isn't it? My brother's going to laugh so hard when he hears this because, like, this is confusing. <laughs> But yeah. I frequently get quite confused about what even mammals are. And I've been known to say things like, is a horse a mammal? Because I get muddled up between mammal and primate. And then I get confused <laughs> that things like donkeys are the same as us because they seem really different. So he's going to laugh his head off when he listens to me trying to get my head around the fact that a bird is a fish and a dinosaur but a dinosaur isn't a dinosaur it's all bags it's what bags they're in <laughs> yeah yeah so th- this is the it's the filing cabinet analogy this is this is what i was taught at school and it's if you wanted the address of a soup you know a super specific address for say like a file held in you know the tax office you'd say it's in england it's in london it's in this area it's on this street it's that building it's the third floor it's the fifth room it's the third filing cabinet it's the second drawer down it's the fifth folder and it's the third page in that folder yeah and that is your going down the chain towards being more and more and more specific with each thing being more specific and so yeah humans are we are on the same street as horses right but yeah we are vertebrate right that's the the kind of thing so you know we are we are vertebrates and we are also tetrapods we have four limbs and we are amniotes because we um have an amnion which reptiles have in the eggs but we have internally and then we are mammals so we have mammal features in particular lactation and usually hair and then group and group and group and group and group and you have to go quite a way down before you actually actually split off horses from primates yeah okay yeah but but ultimately if you're going back the other way birds do sit within dinosaurs and dinosaurs do sit within reptiles the the problem you get there of course is that what the average person thinks of as being a reptile is scaly cold-blooded only lives in the tropics um you know not very active when the sun's not out um and, and that's about it um and of course that's because scientific terminology and common parlance often overlap very carefully and in some places don't at all and reptile is a particularly egregious and awful example of this the one the one which annoys the entomologist is bugs bug means something but bug is the anglicized or the the common term of a certain group of insects that have sucking mouth parts and those are bugs it actually means something um i don't think we do it much in the uk but in america bug is just synonymous with like creepy crawly it's like anything yeah. and so of course that's the that's, that's the entomologist equivalent well it's because that's not a fancy enough word is it you can't just say we're having bug and that's for science now you need to call them like a philodocus plopotus legatus succotus malthus and then we won't use that the hemipterans i think is the correct yeah there you go no term. one's gonna annoy you by using hemipteran wrong because you'd assume that they've been reading Neil Gaiman or something, but bug, you can't you can't have a three letter word be off limits to the general public. That's too difficult for us to remember. We're not smart enough. <laughs> The easiest word has to be left in our jurisdiction. Weirdly, I think terms like idiot are also a scientific word. It's yeah, a, it used to be a medical they are. thing. So, well, you know, yeah, and and more imbecile and, and stuff, and, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, and a, and a whole bunch of them. Yeah, Laura, did we answer your question on dinosaurs? <laughs> yes, <laughs> but now others. I have fifty thousand more, yeah. so I need to come back every week. <laughs> There's a podcast which contains many answers to many questions, which can <laughs> be turned to. You've got yourself a subscriber. <laughs> so a massive thank you to Laura Lex there, who I think I like questions like that because it's revisiting subjects that we've talked about, but you just realise how I re- I personally realise how much I've learned in just a year. How far I've come, Dave? Haven't I come far? Well, you've barely left Reading. So. <laughs> That's true. That is true. <laughs> it's been it's been one of those yeah lockdowns. Fun. I just really want to know the answer, though. Is there a... 
I mean, time machines. Seriously, guys, can we just take a photo? Well, right, but they, but they, but it, but I was gonna say, even if you did that, the average species is around two, three million years, and you've got to find that one individual on in the year yeah, that it was at its peak size. But you could go back size. to any any year, and if you see a group of sauropods, you can still sort of get an idea, a bit more of an idea than we can from just parts of their hip. I mean, yes. <laughs> so, oh yeah, but the set of scales you need is going to be. What I think we need to do is we need to send out some sort of satellites so fast, um, in like yes. fast than the speed of light, and then look <laughs> to turn back, around and look back and look back and then see what it was like. Yeah, yeah with a scale bar, <laughs> or just, or just yeah. basically like if we can find yes. a way of just asking aliens to photograph us before now. Damn, my, I'm always yes. going to be disappointed. Still then, um, what noise do you think? Do you think sauropods would have gone rawr or would have they gone honk? I think probably closer to honking. I, 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 I wonder if they didn't make much noise at all. I mean, I know it's a cliche that giraffes are nearly silent and that, you know, sauropods at least vaguely look like giraffes. But, you, you know, they, they don't need, you know, elephants are making quite a lot of noise because they're communicating various things to each other because they're really quite smart. Hippos, rhinos and giraffe aren't. They haven't got a lot to tell each other. They don't even really need water warning noises because nothing tries to eat them I, they may not have done very much at all well they might have rumbled a bit when they got aggressive saying get away from my forest that yeah. i'm gonna have for tea you know they might Probably. have gone at that i mean certainly giraffes i mean babies apparently bleat like goats though i've never heard one and adult females will make noises when they're distressed particularly if their babies are in trouble but i worked at london zoo for quite a long time with the giraffes and spent quite a lot of time with them out in in the bush and never heard any of them make the slightest noise it's ever they were they talking about absolutely you absolutely silent yeah they were talking about you behind your back it's that thing when you walk in somewhere and everybody shuts up that's what it was all guys yeah. get all uh, it's that man as, as as an aside they're just generally really really quiet the 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 big bull giraffe that we had at london zoo once cr- basically crept up on me across the entire giraffe enclosure and i nearly leapt out of my skin because this head appeared <laughs> over my shoulder Hello. unexpectedly yeah <laughs> good thing it didn't lick you because their tongues are ridiculous yeah, and quite raspy. Yes, indeed. But yeah, no, he'd, he'd, he'd just come over for a look to see what I was doing. But I'd, I'd, I, was, I was sweeping up and he's all the way over there. And I turned back to what I was doing and boom, this head just came over my shoulder. Hello, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Were you wearing Lynx? Was that it, was it? <laughs> no, no. It's like it Lynx was, Africa, it was, I love it. Lynx Africa, yes. Yeah, <laughs> all right then. Well, until next week. thank you for listening to the terrible lizards podcast especially if you're a patron without you we wouldn't have made this series to be the first to hear bonus episodes and get extended interviews please consider donating at patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards you can find us on twitter facebook and youtube so you don't miss out on live broadcasts All the links are available in the show notes or go to terriblelizards.co.uk. If you can't afford to support us financially, please do share this episode with your friends and leave us a review on your podcast app. Do say hello via social media or drop us an email, terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. We love hearing from you and we love to answer your dinosaur questions. 